Shalom dear friends, welcome to a new episode where we are going to concentrate a little more on uh, the Ten Commandments or what we traditionally call as Decalogue which forms the epitome of uh, Israel's duties towards God and uh, neighbor. It was the belief of Israel, of course, attested by several texts, that the Ten Commandments were inscribed on two stone tablets with the terms of the covenant written by the finger of God. For example, Exodus um, 31, 18, the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant written by the finger of God. And when you take 32 15, Moses held his hands the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant they were inscribed on both sides front and back in um, 34 1 cut two tablets of stone like the former ones and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you broke. It says, I will write on the tablets. Yahweh will write on the tablets. So these repeated expressions highlight the importance of the origin and thus the sac sacrality of the Decalogue. These are basic principles that guarantee freedom and fraternity for all people. Friends, in the previous episode, I gave some explanations of the same. Now, at the beginning of uh, this session, I would like to clarify certain points. First of all, the numerations of commandments differs slightly in various church traditions. For example, the Anglican, the Greek and Reformed traditions uh, which is uh, um, close to the numeration of the Jewish text, reckon the prohibitions against false worship as two, as two commandments, whereas the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans count them as one commandment, the first commandment, and 
divide the last commandments as two. Thus, for the first group of churches, that is for the Anglicans and the Reformed churches, the Orthodox, the first commandment is given in chapter 20, verses 2 to 3. While for the Catholics, verses 2 to form the first commandment. So, the two commandments of the Anglicans and Orthodox are put together in the Catholic commandment as the first commandment. Catholic tradition as the first commandment. Now, 20 verse 17. The Catholics divide into two. While the Jewish, Anglican and Orthodox traditions keep verse 17 as the 10th commandment. The Catholics divide that 9th commandment into two. 9 as 9 and 10. Recognizing the dignity of uh, women. In the ancient Hebrew mentality, wives were husband's possession, like many other uh, material possessions. So, 2017, you shall not set your heart on your neighbor's house. You shall not set your heart on your neighbor's wife or servant, man or woman or ox or donkey or any of your neighbor's possessions. It is significant to note that many law codes in Mesopotamian and Egyptian cultures are conditional with if like if this is the situation you must do this even uh, in the book of Deuteronomy and many other law codes in the Bible they follow the same principle if you obey these blessings shall come to you. However, the Ten Commandments are very different. There are no conditions, no ifs and buts. It is valid for all time and all situations. The Covenant Code about which I spoke uh, briefly in the previous uh, session goes from chapter 20 verse 22 to chapter 23 verse 33 is also known as the book of the covenant containing 54 laws. This is the oldest law code and maybe the most important. An internal reading of the laws will point to these codes as legal codes of a community of shepherds and peasants who had already settled um, they had a settled way of living for quite some time uh, let's now move to um, chapter 21 33 um, the laws regarding property damages Israel never exacted the death penalty for crimes against property, something that the western countries did not acknowledge until the beginning of the last century. The general principle is this, an individual who has been wronged in his property is to be compensated. The compensation is penal in character and usually greater than the damaged cost. The laws regarding theft of animals in chapter 22, 1 to 4 um, deal uh, with the stealing. Um, for example, verse 3, 
or rather there are two laws in this the thief should pay back either five times verse 1 or two times in verse 4 as the case may be in verse 3 for example um, they mean that if caught in the act at night the invader may be slain with the impunity but if slain in broad daylight there is blood guilt but there are many punishments like a sorcery bestiality that is sexual relations with animals and idolatry are crimes deserving capital punishment now there are laws of compassion and justice 22 verse 20 to 28 23 9 very significant very important the God of Israel is the protector of the disenfranchised they are the widow the orphan the resident sojourner or the alien and the poor so these four categories or the first three called the biblical triad they are they need special protection from God the resident aliens in the Bible play a major role and the rights given to them is revolutionary because no ancient Near Eastern culture gave any right or privilege to aliens. The situation of Israel was that they were once upon a time strangers, foreigners in a foreign land. Now, as outsiders, they, these uh, uh, aliens, they are very vulnerable because they do not have the support of any clan. And thus, God uh, enjoins the Israel to give them special protection. Since the economy of the uh, de depended on the male heads of the household, widows and orphans, they are actually sociological terms, are exposed to greatest uh, dangers. To counteract these dangers, the legislation in verses 23, verse 24, insists on divine involvement. Uh, Yahweh will listen to the laments and take punitive uh, action against the guilty. Israel's conviction truly strong society provides for its weakest members. So Israel is given a special mandate or responsibility to take care of these vulnerable people. From verse 25 to 27, you know, the, about um, giving loans. The loans were not made for commercial purposes, but to alleviate distress. Now, to take uh, interest upon them would be to profit from another's misfortune. Verse 25 to 27, chapter 22, 20, 25 27, very significant. The poor were specifically protected by God. Their outer garment that is mentioned here in um, uh, verse 25 26 which is served as their blanket at night. The outer garment of the poor person had to be returned to them by evening. Because a loan with a garment as security could be okay for the day when he may not, the poor person may not need it for the day. But for the night, that is the 
only dress for him to keep warm. Amos chapter 2 verse 5, for example, accuses the wealthy of sleeping upon garments taken in pledge. The cry of such cloakless Israelite merits prompt action from Yahweh. When the people of Israel forget, Yahweh intervenes. Now we come to the sabbatical year and the Sabbath and the great feast. Chapter 23, 10 to 19. The law of the sabbatical year, uh, which is parallel uh, in uh, Leviticus 25, Deuteronomy 24, Deuteronomy 26, is meant to benefit the poor, the fields, the vineyards, and olive groves are to lie fallow every seven years. The poor are envisioned as the primary beneficiaries of uh, this institution, and they can glean collect these grains and, uh, uh, and another compassionate institution is that of the Sabbath in chapter 23 verse 12. The intention is to give rest to animals that work in the field and provide some respite to the underprivileged such as slaves and uh, Aliens, the slave, your ox, your donkey may have relief and the resident alien may be refreshed. They, we speak of three pilgrimage fees that are obligatory. Every adult Jew, male Jew should make pilgrimage to the central sanctuary. The three principal feasts are first. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread, celebrated during spring. It celebrates the beginning of the barley feast. It is connected to the time the Israelites came out of Egypt. The second is the Feast of the Harvest or the Feast of the Weeks or it is called the Feast of the Pentecost. This takes place 50 days after the unleavened bread and it marks the end of the wheat harvest. And the third feast is the feast of the shelters or the booths or it's known as the feast of the tabernacles uh, used uh, even in the New Testament, the Gospels, the Gospel of, uh, especially in the Gospel according to John. This is the feast at the end of the year. It is also called the feast of the tents. It celebrates the ingathering of all the produce of the field. Since these three pilgrimage feasts are agricultural, they were actually celebrated after the desert experience after they entered the promised land and settled down as uh, farmers. The covenant code concludes with the several sacrificial injunctions supplementing the three pilgrimage feasts. There are four ritual regulations. I would like to uh, highlight on uh, uh, chapter 23 verse 19 a special note on uh, this statement you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's uh, uh, milk do not boil a kid in the milk of its mother this is the foundation for the Jewish dietary law known 
as kosher. What is this? What does kosher mean? It does not allow the consumption of meat and milk or milk products during the same meal. In Hebrew, kasher means fit or proper or legitimate, legitimate for consumption. So the mixtures of milk and meat or the expression meat and milk are forbidden by the Jewish law. It makes uh, it's against the kosher law and the prohibition is found in three texts uh, Exodus 23 19 34 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 14 21 this legislation probably is a reaction to the Canaanite custom mentioned in the Ras Shamra text of uh, cooking a kid in uh, milk, which was found in the excavations in 1928. The Jewish observance is that fish, eggs, fruits, vegetables, grains can be eaten with either meat or dairy products. The utensils that have come into contact with meat should not be used with uh, dairy and uh, vice versa. What do you mean by this kosher food? Those that conform to the Jewish dietary laws. Kashrut Kashrut is the body of Jewish law dealing with what foods the Jews can and cannot eat and how those foods must be prepared and eaten. There are strict laws concerning this. For the modern Jews, the laws of Kashrut are simply primitive health regulations that have become obsolete considering the modern methods of food preparation. We may speak of it more when we come to the book of uh, Leviticus that speak about uh, the clean food and unclean food. So we come to the conclusion of the covenant code in chapter 23 verse 32 33 a list of blessings that form obedience to the law obedience to the terms of the code in fact most if not all the ancient law codes concluded with blessings and curses. See for example the holiness code in Leviticus chapter 26 or Deuteronomy chapters 27 and 28. Let's now move um, to the text soon after this. Verse 20 to 22. 20 to 22. Like the blessing promised to Jacob leaving Canaan in Genesis 28:15, God is sending an angel. He says, be sure I am with you. I shall keep you safe wherever you go and bring you back to this country. For I shall never desert you. I shall never desert you. Yahweh will be with the people through an angel. Verse 20 I am going to send an angel in front of you to guard you on the way. God is present in the form of a messenger. Such 
presence will mean protection against all enemies as they march towards the promised land in fact uh, the expression is angel who prepares the way we have a number of texts chapter 32:2 isaiah 63:9 malachi prophet malachi chapter 3:1 which will be quoted in the gospel according to mark god's presence with the people leading them to the land it's a constant theme is a constant theme both in the exodus prophet isaiah other parts of um, old testament and also in the gospel you know the expressions like the angel pillar of cloud pillar of fire ark etc they are all symbols of god's ever abiding presence so disobedience to the angel is disobedience to god and that's what is there in verse 21 be attentive to him you know when at time at a, t- a time when israel is threatened by canaanite ways since she is now living side by side with the canaanites they have to be careful in verse 22 if you listen attentively i will be an enemy to your enemies and then verse 23 onwards the angel goes and their allegiance is always to yahweh and to the covenant that is the uppermost even while living with the canaanites the names of the countries mentioned in verse 23 they are not to adopt their ways obedience will bring blessings in abundance abundance of food and drink health and fertility and a long life verse 25 to 26 we move to chapter 24 the ceremony of the covenant ratification the ratification of the covenant takes place on mount sinai in the presence of moses and 70 elders of israel this is celebrated with a solemn ceremony with a festive meal by means of a meal yahweh takes the whole community represented by the clan elders and bringing them into his own family according to one tradition moses alone that shows the special role of moses as covenant mediator uh, moses is found alone with god but in the e elohis tradition another version people's participation is highlighted the sealing of the covenant with the blood rite the presence of the people yahweh takes the whole community represented by clan elders the clan elders represents represent the entire people of god when you go to verse 4 uh, you know the participation of the people is represented by the presence of 12 pillars the 12 pillars corresponding to the 12 tribes of israel moses took the blood of the sacrificed animals and threw half of it against the altar and the other half he sprinkled over the people as a sign of their acceptance the blood of the covenant remember the expression the blood of the covenant matthew chapter 26 28 1 corinthians chapter 11 25 they reflect the ancient view that blood 
was efficacious in establishing community between God and human beings. Now, the conclusion to this um, ratification, Moses ascends the mountain with Joshua to receive the tablets. This departure will set the stage from the, uh, to, uh, the, from the golden uh, stage um, for the golden calf story which we will see in chapter 32. Sinai is the place par excellence for Yahweh's manifestation. So throughout the Exodus event, Mount Sinai takes a great significance. Um, the priestly writer makes the desert sanctuary a portable replica of the temple in Jerusalem. In chapter 24, 12 to 14, there is a separate tradition about the gift of the tablets of stone on which the Decalogue was uh, written. While in uh, verse um, uh, 24 verses 15 to 18, um, what is um, given importance is the theophany. Theophany, manifestation of God. The Hebrew word that is used is a kabod, glory of God, manifestation of uh, God's presence. Friends, there is a profound theological statement of the significance of Sinai. The cloud covers the mountain and Yahweh's glory fills the sanctuary. Yahweh calls Moses on the seventh day after six days of preparation. So the uh, seventh day because Moses has been preparing for six days for this encounter. In Leviticus chapter 9 1 Moses summons Aaron, his sons and the elders of Israel on the eighth day. So Yahweh's glory is viewed as a consuming fire. Fire comes from Yahweh's presence and consumes the entire sacrifice. There is a paral parallelism between the manifestation on Mount Sinai and the first act of worship after that manifestation. Sinai becomes the model for worship. So the mother of uh, the worship goes back to the Sinai experience. In the old covenant on Mount Sinai, we have the context of fear, awe and trembling. We are instead commemorating the new covenant in the context of a fraternal meal. Remember the New Testament. We have the uh, realization of the old covenant on Mount Sinai. In this fraternal meal, new covenant, importance is given to love and sharing. Instead of the many commandments of Sinai, many don'ts and do's, the new covenant there is just one. Just one. John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Friends, the new covenant in the New Testament is the realization of the old covenant. Shalom and God be with you. Thank you Lord for the gift and love of your sacred word.
open our hearts to put into practice that which you have revealed to us through your word amen